Now, we're going to continue our series called Joyful, and we launched it last week, and it's, built, it's based out of Philippians. And uh, so I asked everyone to bring your Bibles. That was your homework assignment. If you have your Bibles, raise your hand with your Bibles. Just want to see all the Bibles out there, all right? Wow, people did, you guys did really well, all right, compared to first service and thir- Thursday night service, okay? So you guys are rocking it. So that's your homework assignment. Bring your Bibles. We are studying a very short letter called Philippians, and we're learning a lot out of that because Paul is going to actually 16 times in this little short letter of four verses, he's going to say joy or rejoicing. And also, he's going to talk about thinking. 16 times. He's going to use the mind or thought. He's going to use some kind of word 16 times because so much of joy has to do with how you think your perspective is very, very important. In fact, I would say it's everything. It reminds me of the lady who's sitting in front of a a mirror, full-length mirror, and there she is in her bedroom, and the husband's there, and, and she kind of says this comment to him while he's in there. She says, you know, the doctor says I have a fine figure for a woman my age. And the husband says, well, uh, did he mention anything about your rear end? And the wife responded, she says, no, your name did not get brought up once. Not one single time was your name brought up. All right? So perspective is everything, right? I mean, it really is super important. And so we're going to dive into this series. And I think about perspective. I think about jury duty. How many of you have, raised, have done jury duty? Raise your hand if you've ever done jury duty. You know what that's like. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous, right? It's like I could be doing so many other things. And a pastor was talking about one time in California, which had jury duty. And everybody there is on their cell phones. They don't want to be there. They wish there was somebody else. It, it's like a doom and gloom kind of vibe in the room. And all of a sudden, the pastor talked about this time when a guy named Jerry shows up, or Larry. Larry comes in, and he's talking about the honor of serving his community and the honor of serving his neighbors. He talked about the nobility of jury duty. He mentioned a 95-year-old woman who, who, who took three buses to get there that day to serve on jury. And then he talked about the foundation of the entire judicial system. He, how blessed we are to live in the land where you can go before your peers to be judged. How there are people all around the world who are sacrificing and even dying for the privilege that they get to have that day day to serve on jury duty. And the pastor said that when Larry gave that speech, people kind of got off their phones and started sitting up a little bit more straight. Their perspectives started changing. He also talked about that, you know, they go through a selection process and he went before the judge and the judge asked the pastor, said, um, you know, can you pronounce anyone guilty? (laughs) And the pastor says, well, I'm a pastor and the Bible says everybody's guilty. I can pronounce you guilty, judge. And well, at least to say, he didn't get to serve on jury duty, um, that go around. But, but the pastor reflected on what Larry did. He said, the entire room transformed from a bunch of self-absorbed, cell phone staring draftees to a community of joyful patriots. And I'm telling you right now, man, your perspective is everything. And so, and so I just want to share with you today that how important it is, because here's the thing, nothing kills joy more than stinking thinking. And you can go ahead and put that on Facebook or Twitter or no more MySpace, all right? Nothing kills joy more than stinking thinking. And that happens to us all the time. And here's a joy killer, and one of the things we think about that kills our joy, and that is I must control the outcome. We think I can control the outcome. And so many of us are frustrated so much of the time because circumstances, let's be honest, are constantly not obeying our orders, right? I mean, things don't work the way that I want, and people don't do what I want, and people don't show up when I want, and things don't happen as quick as I want. And it's not just the big things. I'm talking about the little things, man. The little things can really zap your joy because the coach didn't play my kid as much as I want. Or or they didn't bring my food out to me as fast as I want. Or people on Highway 17 out here, they don't drive like I want. Can I get amen on that, right? I mean, let me ask you, are you you going to stand before the Almighty God and have to explain why someone got the parking spot that you wanted and that was worth sacrificing your testimony as a Christian? I mean, we've got to think of bigger, bigger picture. And so, so maturity says this. Maturity says, I don't have to let things I cannot control 
control me. That was so good, I'm going to say it again, then I'm going to amen myself, okay? I don't have to let things I cannot control control me, amen? I mean, we get so wound up about things that we cannot control. And I'm going to tell you right now, the news media knows that about you. And there's things you can't do anything about it, but you get all riled up about stuff you cannot control. And it rocks your world and takes away your joy. And the reason why we have the book of Philippians, because, let's just be honest, Paul was going through things he couldn't control. I mean, he didn't want to be arrested for Jesus. That's not something he was like, you know, this is on my to-do list. That's not something he wanted, but he was willing to. He did not want to be uh, falsely accused. He did not want to be manipulated as a political pawn. He did not want to be shipwrecked. He did not, be, he did not want to be sitting in a jail for, for who knows how long before a court date. He was dealing with unjust arrest and unfair criticism, an uncertain future, and he had no control over the outcomes, but the outcomes, listen, had no control over his joy. The outcome had no control over Paul's joy. So we're going to read one of the greatest texts in the Bible right here in Philippians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to chapter 1 of Philippians. It's also on the screen. Starting in verse 12, here's what Paul says. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me is actually served to, I love this word, advance that's the word we're going to lock on to in a second. Advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that, man, I am in chains for Jesus Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters around here now have become what? They become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without what? Without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and some out of rivalry, but others, believe it or not, out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel of Jesus. The former, though, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what in the world, what in the world does it matter? The important thing, more important than my comfort, and my out, outcome, the important thing is that every way, whether from false motives or true motives, read with me, church, Christ is preached. And because of this, man, I rejoice, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly ex expect and hope that I will in no, well, no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is what? To die is gain. So Paul is not in control of the outcome. But Paul says this, I will rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. And here's the perspective that Paul had. It's the opposite of a joy killer, it's a joy filler. And here it is, I can't control the outcome, but I can control my outlook. I cannot control how long I live. I can't control a lot of things in my life, but I can control my outlook. See, there's a certain type of reflection in your life that is guaranteed to produce resentment. And there's another reflection in life that is guaranteed to produce rejoicing. And Paul intentionally chose the latter. Instead of sitting around and feeling sorry for himself as a man in prison, he chose to look at himself no matter what his circumstances, a man in Christ. And consequently, his circumstances never transcended his identity. His circumstances never transcended the mission. See, the story you're telling yourself right now, because every one of you is telling yourself a story about your life, depends on your perspective. Do you see joy as an outcome? Do you see joy that you're waiting on, right? So you can finally be happy, or are you in this camp? Do you see joy as a decision? No matter what you're going through, you either look at it as an outcome or you look at it as a decision. And Paul did not have to wait on the outcome to determine his outlook. 
You can chain his feet, but you cannot chain Paul's mind. You can't chain how he thinks. And so at the beginning, he tells the Philippians not, I love this, not how he's doing. He tells the Philippians at the very beginning of the letter how the mission is doing. For Paul, it's not about how he's doing. It's about the mission. And here's what he says. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me has helped to spread, the other translation said advance, to help spread the good news. Notice he thinks this, that the gospel cannot be chained. <laughs> you can't chain the gospel, church. He didn't think about what's being done to him. He thought about what's being done through him. And I want you to know what's happened has helped to advance, he says, the spread of the gospel. Now the word advance or spread is a military word. Uh, armies would move from one city to another city, one location to another location. And on their way, the Roman army would actually have someone in advance of them to remove brush so the army could go through. And Paul is saying this. I want you to understand that what's happened to me has actually been used to advance, to spread, to improve the access that people have to hear about Jesus. And I rejoice in that. I'm going to rejoice because of my imprisonment. Jesus talk is happening all over this city. Besides what he says is he loves, he says, I'm going to rejoice every single day. I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to witness to the most elite regimen in the Roman army. Now, that elite regimen is called the Praetorian Guard. They were Caesar's bodyguards. They would keep Caesar's prisoners and guard them. That's why he will say at the end of Philippians, he would say, greetings from the brethren in Caesar's household. The question, how do we get brethren, how do we get followers of Jesus in Caesar's household? I'll tell you why. They were chained to Paul for two years. That's how. They were chained to Paul. Now, let me ask you this question. If you're chained to Paul... Who is really chained to who? (laughs) You ever thought about that? If you're chained to Paul, who's really chained to who? I mean, the, the, the soldier shows up and he thinks, you know what, I'm here to guard you on behalf of Caesar. And Paul's going, no, 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 no. I'm here to guard you on behalf of Jesus. He's rejoicing that because he's in prison, it's called, it's caused more people to step up and spread the good news about Jesus Christ. He says, man, some are doing it with good attitudes, and I'm thankful for that. Some are spreading the good news of Jesus for, for with bad attitudes. And guess what? I'm thankful for that. Now, I don't know why, but sometimes we human beings love it when somebody else is in a bad place. Like, it makes us feel better. So while Paul is in prison, some people are out there trying to promote themselves. And Paul is saying, man, they're preaching the gospel with bad intentions. But guess what? They're still preaching Jesus. One thing that should excite you is this. And I don't think many people heard what I've said in the last couple of services, so maybe you guys can pick up on this a little bit better, okay? Here's what should excite you, is that the gospel is so powerful that it can't even be chained by the mixed motives from the people who preach it. That's something you ought to be thankful for. Because I want to tell you something, I want to tell you kind of an inside secret about those of us, should be all of us, by the way, but all, all of us who preach the gospel. You have never heard anyone preach the gospel with absolutely pure motives. Why? Because every one of us who preaches is whacked up, all right? Now, I trust you guys, don't tell the other services I said that, okay? But anyway, every one of us is whacked up, every one of us is fallen, including myself. But the gospel, listen, is so powerful that you can't even chain it with flawed people who preach it like me. And that's good news for all of us. And Paul is so excited about the gospel is being preached, he's not pretending like he's genuinely excited, authentically rejoicing in the confidence in a God who can bring good news out of bad. 
So instead of thinking, man, why is this happening to me? Paul is choosing to think, so how can I leverage what has happened to me so that more people hear about Jesus? Because for Paul, that's what life's all about. That's the mission. That's the new way of thinking. And that brought Paul so much joy. But that kind of rejoicing needs a constant refilling. And so Paul says these words, and I will continue to rejoice in verse 19, for I know that as you do what, church? Read it with me. As you do what? Pray for me, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me. This will lead to my deliverance. See, not only can you not chain the gospel, Paul says this, spiritual help, spiritual help from God cannot be chained either. Because there is no chain, there is no arrest or even delay that happens with the prayers of God's people. There is no place you can lock out the ministry of the Spirit of God. Jesus doesn't just rule over our chains, man. He sustains us in the midst of our chains. Jesus can always, no matter what your situation is, can always send you help. And listen to this. You cannot chain the prayers of God's people, church. You can't chain that. And Paul is saying that one of the ways that we experience the Holy Spirit in our lives is through the prayers of our brothers and our sisters. They are feeling of the spirits often connected with the kneeling of the saints that what often I cannot get done with my hands, I can get done better and more efficiently for the kingdom if I will drop down to my knees. So there's a dear disciple in Russia. Her name is Aria. You've never heard of her name before, but many disciples in Russia have. They've been encouraged by her. Let me tell you her story. She was brought up in Soviet Union underneath communist rule, and she was forbidden to go public about her Christian faith. And she grew in her faith, and she started writing about her faith, and that's what got her exposed to the government. And they arrested her at age 28 years old, threw her in jail. I'm not talking about just any jail. Seven years of hard labor in brutal, cold camps. Practically starving alive and spent many months in solitary confinement. And during that time, she would write poetry in her head <laughs> because she could not, she had no tablet, she had nothing to write it down with. And so I want to share with you one of the poems that she wrote in her head while she was in solitary confinement. And she said these words Believe me, it was often thus in solitary cells on wintry nights. A sudden sense of joy and warmth and then unsleeping. I would huddle by an icy wall and then realize someone, someone is thinking of me. Someone is petitioning the Lord for me. Has that ever happened to you? Has ever happened, you're in a hard season, you're in a tough place, and then out of nowhere, just sending on you a supernatural peace, an unexplainable joy, you know what was happening? Someone was praying for you. Someone was praying for you, and the Holy Spirit responded. I'm one of the most prayed for people I know. I think about when I came in the world, I had a family that prayed for me. I think about in children's ministry and church, man, I had people praying for me. I got in student ministry. I had student pastors and other people in student ministry pray for me. I had mentors pray for me. I had uh, uh, churches who prayed for me. I've had other pastors who prayed for me. I've had so many people have been involved in so many different ministries who have prayed for me. Volumes and volumes and volumes of prayers. I'm telling you right now, church, that those prayers have an impact. You cannot chain that. You cannot chain the prayers of God's people. In Acts chapter 13, Paul and his companions are kicked out of a town. And that happened quite often to them, by the way. And it says in Acts chapter 13, it says that the followers of Jesus, man, they were filled with what? They were filled with joy and the what? And the Holy Spirit. See, joy and the Holy Spirit travel together. See, when the Holy Spirit descends... Joy happens. You cannot chain that. And one more thing you can't chain is courage cannot be chained. I want you to think about this. What is the opposite of joy? What's the opposite of joy? Many people probably right now are thinking, well, sadness. It must be sadness. 
Well, I would say to you, you're wrong. Why? Because I believe you can be sad and you can be joyful at the exact same time. You ever been to a funeral of, of, of a follower of Jesus? I mean, there's this, there's this uh, sadness because we miss them and we long for them. We don't have them in our life anymore. But there's also a joy because we know that they're finally in their eternal home. We know that we're going to see them again. If you ever had a son or a daughter like I had who left for college, uh, left for college back in 2021, or who went to the military, you know exactly how this feels. I mean, you're just, you're crying because you just can't believe that your child has now left the nest. I mean, it's just amazing. You're just sad about that, but you're also happy because you're just so excited about what the next chapter of their life is going to be like. You grieve and have joy at the same time. So the opposite of joy is not sadness. The opposite of joy is fear. Let me tell you why. Joy is absent whenever worry and anxiety and fear is present. It's like oil and water. They can't both coincide. Notice Paul said, I will certainly, I'm going to rejoice of my deliverance. But he didn't say, I'm certain of what my deliverance will look like. He has no clue, but he's certain of his deliverance. He says, I expect and hope that I will not fail Christ in anything. But that I will have the courage now, as always, to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth, whether I live or whether I die. Paul is saying this, you cannot change my courage because you cannot change my mission. You can't change my courage. You can't change my courage because you cannot change my mission. See, my mission, Paul says, is all about Jesus Christ. So you can let me live or you can kill me. Either way, it's going to be a theater to display the greatness of Jesus Christ. I'm going to exalt Jesus if I live. I'm going to exalt Jesus if I die. Vindication or execution, Paul says, it is a win-win situation. You cannot chain my courage because you cannot change what my life is all about. You see, he says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is what? Is gain. Let me tell you why so many people are so miserable, why so many people are not joyful. It's because they live by a different motto than that. And their motto goes something like this, for to live is me and to die is tragic. And they're not, they're not happy people. They're not joyful people when things don't go the way they want them to go. Several years ago in Phoenix, Arizona, it was this weird phenomenon. There was along a road, they kept finding these dead, large pelicans from California, of all places. They're trying to figure out, how do they wind up here in the middle of the hot desert? What was happening is the, the pelicans caught wind currents, and then all of a sudden, they started seeing the roads. And if you've ever looked down a dark asphalt road in the middle of summer, it looks like there's like water at the end of it, right? It's a mirage. And so the pelicans were thinking that was water. And so they, fly, they were flying along that road, and all of a sudden, what happened was they landed on that hard black asphalt, which they thought looked like water. They descended and they landed expecting refreshment and cool it, and just a cooling it, obviously, environment, water and food. And instead, reality hit them hard, and the opposite is what they found. And if you're spending the best of your life, your time, your energy, pursuing what's ultimately a mirage, reality is going to hit you hard. And you realize what you invested in did not lead you to joy, but it zapped actually joy out of you. See, every day you're filling in with your own answers. And the only answers you have to fill in are this to this question right here. To live is what? And to die is what? What, what is it for you that you fill in there? And how are you living your life? To, to live is this hobby or this job or this, this look or this image. And to die leads to what? Ultimately, whatever you fill in, the blanks decides if you'll have joy that is chained or not. For instance, maybe you'll say to live is money. And to die is to leave it to someone else. Maybe you say, you know, to live is to be well known, and to die is to be quickly forgotten. 
Maybe you say to live is to have a lot of influence and to die is to have none. Are you putting in those blanks something that cannot, that cannot change joy whether you live or whether you die? And if you're not, you need to change your thinking because unchanged joy is rooted in one thing that the future can only enhance. Paul is saying, I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know how all this ends. <laughs> I know how all this ends. To live is Christ and to die is what? To die is gain. How do you chain a man like that? How do you chain a man with so much hope? I know if Paul showed up here, he would pray over us from Romans chapter 15. It's a great, beautiful prayer. And he says this. He says, I pray that, that God, the source of what, church? The source of hope will fill you completely with what? Joy and peace because you trust. Because you trust in him. Because you trust in him. Because joy is the outlook when you trust that Jesus decides the outcome. Joy is the outlook when you trust that Jesus Christ decides the outcome. Now, let's be honest. Man, we go through all kinds of things in life that we would never choose, right? There's a whole bunch of things that happened to me and happened to you that I would never, ever choose in my life. But nothing we go through can keep us from choosing joy. Amen? Nothing you go through can keep you from choosing joy. Now, because we believe that Jesus is all the outcome, that changes everything in every situation. There's a family in our own church called Glenn and Randy, and they head up our Celebrate Recovery team, and they are phenomenal. If you spend any time with Glenn and Randy, I'm telling you right now, the joy of the Lord pours out of every part of their being. And they're just so, uh, uh, just so affirming and edifying to be with, encouraging. And it's because the joy of the Lord is inside of them. But listen, that does not mean life's been easy. In fact, I have found this to be the case. The people who go through the most trials, who overcome the most difficult situations in life, oftentimes, because they chose joy in those situations, they're the most joyful people you'll meet in your life. And I hope as you watch this video, it'll inspire you for whatever trial you're walking through to choose joy. Check this video out. Well, my life before Jesus was simply put as self-will run riot. It was all about me. I used people and I loved things. I had God, it was totally ignored and um, now, since, since Jesus, uh, that's completely turned around. I love God, love people, and use things the way it's supposed to be. And for me, my life was totally aimless. I was always looking for love in the wrong places, to find fun and joy in things and situations, and now I love God and people, and things are just something that are a byproduct, and they're certainly not as near important as my relationship with the Lord. Well, my early childhood was kind of tough. Uh, I wasn't so much a child of uh, God at the time, but uh, I was physically and emotionally abused. That ended when my dad committed suicide when I was 11 years old, which sent me into a kind of a downward spiral of drugs, alcohol, and, uh, and even criminal activity as I wound up in a motorcycle gang. Um, the Vietnam War was raging and I wound up in the military, so that helped me hit the pause button on some of that activity and gave me a little bit of perspective. But accepting Jesus was a huge, uh, huge change in my life, and it allowed me to, uh, well, I first accepted him as my savior. The Lord part was kind of an incremental thing. I did it one character defect at a time, and I'm a slow learner. But I did have a lot of issues that I worked through and still work through today. And for me, um, I've suffered many trials, beginning with being adopted at 18 months of age. Uh, which I didn't realize until I was an adult, created some abandonment issues. I have suffered two miscarriages as a married woman to Glenn. Uh, we went through an abortion, which was very, very difficult. Uh, we've had numerous moves throughout the years, and they were up and down the East Coast, but they definitely brought some trials and tribulations to the marriage. Uh, we lost grandparents and lots of other relatives and friends along the way. We went through financial crisis, um, and I had stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma 11 years ago. Whew. 
Well, I got to tell you, you know, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that it's all rainbows and unicorns. Um, you know, the Christian life isn't a playground, it's a battleground. Um, the enemy will do anything to keep you from switching sides. And uh, eight years ago, we lost our adult daughter to an accidental overdose, and that's the toughest thing any parent could possibly endure. Uh, if your parents die, they call you an orphan. If your spouse dies, they call you a widow or a widower. There's not even a name for that kind of pain because uh, it's so horrendous. That's true. When I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, stage four, I thought, well, I didn't know if I was going to live or die, and then I realized that I was going to survive, and I had to go through two years of chemotherapy, and I thought, surely this is the worst thing I will ever endure in my life. But that was a walk in the park next to losing our adult daughter at 33 years old. Kristen was um, the love of our life, and uh, it just was something that we still wake up some days and go, is this still a nightmare? But we realize with Christ it isn't, and we will see her again. And But that is most certainly the worst trial we've ever had to endure. Amen. It took a lot of work. Um, we had the most phenomenal church family around us at the time. We were living up in Maryland at the time. And they, the family came, as well as friends from church, our life group, our Celebrate Recovery family. We got into Grief Share up there. We actually went through it twice. But without community, we could never have done it. And in addition to that, it was most important that we drew closer in our daily morning prayer time. We did a book for a year of, of a, devo a devotional on losing somebody and what it's like to walk out that grief. And we just have the hope in reading the Bible every day and in God's promises, we are going to be reunited with her again. Mm -hmm. And this life is a flash or a blink Great. and we will be with her. And although while some days seem very, very long and it's very painful, um, the Lord has given us so much joy in all of his promises and they are real and yes and amen. That's right. Um, I actually feel God's pleasure when I worship, and that's either either playing or just participating in the stand. And I actually led worship at our daughter's funeral. We did the song In Christ Alone, among a couple of others. Um, it's, it's a choice that we all have. Every single problem, any joy that we have, it's not meant for us to, to handle alone. It's meant to be shared. And like Randy said, we'll be rejoined with our loved ones in the kingdom. So it's just... Um, it's just a vapor that we're going through right now, and uh, eternity is an awful long time. Can we give God the praise for the story of Glenn and Randy? It's just amazing to see that what they've walked through, instead of staying, and why is this happening to me, Lord? They said, you know what, how we can't control the outcome, but we can control our outlook. And God, how can you use this as we grieve and as we suffer, as we cry? How can you use this, God, to show the love and grace and the greatness of Jesus Christ as we choose joy? And that perspective has changed their life and has changed our life. It's blessed them and it's blessed our life because of the choice that they made. The same thing can happen in your life. See, nothing you go through can stop you from choosing joy. See, here's the thing. Jesus is going to be exalted whether you exalt him or not. But there is nothing that can stop Jesus from being exalted in you if you would just choose. If you would just choose joy. And I'm begging and I'm imploring for you. Think about it. Just think about it. We're going to sing a song, and as Randy, as Glenn said, you know, when you feel God's pleasure when we worship, and sometimes I always go, you know, when I'm in a season of worry, I worship because I cannot, it's impossible to worry and worship at the same time. <laughs> it's like trying to sneeze with your eyes open, okay, just not going to work. Sometimes, if you want joy, just, just worship. And we're going to do that right, right now in a moment, and as we're doing that, if you need prayer, we, you know, Paul said, I need your prayers because your prayers, man, the Spirit is keeping me strong here in my prison. You've got a prison. You're probably in a prison right now. 
and you need brothers and sisters to pray for you. We would love to do that. So you can come as we worship. Why don't you stand right now? Let me pray over you. Father, I'm begging you to water through the Holy Spirit what has been planted today through your word, through Glenn and Randy's testimony. And I'm praying for those who are in a tough place right now. Like Paul, they're in a prison and they need a joy infusion. And Father, they need to change the way they've been thinking. So may your spirit enlighten them with a new perspective to see things in light of the gospel of Jesus. And may your joy be released out of them. Father, I know there are people who are listening right now to my voice in this room online, and they have put the wrong things in the blanks. And they are never going to experience authentic joy that can last supernaturally until they live for Jesus Christ. And so I'm praying for their salvation today, Father. I pray that they will choose very soon to be followers of Jesus, to be redeemed by Jesus' blood. So today I pray for encouragement. I pray for salvation for others so that all of us, everyone listening to my voice, can live with joy for your glory. And we pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. So we're going to worship right now. And you can come up here. And we would love to pray with you. Whatever it is, won't you come right now. You guys in the line can hit the request prayer button. Let's worship our God and bring joy. May joy descend on us right now.